Have you ever been called a band geek, a theater nerd, cyber dork, studio rat, gamer punk, orchestra dork, book monkey, drama jock, poindexter, artsy fartsy, or just plain weird? Well then, welcome to Art Nerds. This is the podcast where we sit down with our nerdy friends, embrace our inner geek, and celebrate our art. And welcome back, my friends. This is Art Nerds. This is the place where we talk to our nerdy friends about their artwork. My name is Michael Bryan, and today uh, I have with me uh, a young lady named Caitlin Bossert. Am I saying that right? Boss Hart. Boss Hart. Yep. Just like it's written. Yep. Just like it's written. <laughs> Caitlin, <laughs> Caitlin Boss Hart. And um, she, this, uh, the best way I can describe it on a quick and dirty note, because I'm going to let her talk about it, is uh, she's an artist in her own right, but she has a very, very unique connection to art and to other artists, which I think is fascinating and uplifting and uh, great fuel, great fuel for thought. Uh, Caitlin, well, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna shut up. Uh, what is your art? So, what I knew you were gonna ask me that question partly because I've listened to your to your podcast before, and it's a question that um, honestly causes me a little bit of anxiety. And this is true for a lot of multi passionate people. It's the like, what do you do type of question, because I don't have a a simple in the box, you know, type of, of response. Um, but what I see as my art can go a lot of different directions. There's definitely my more traditional art. I love to paint specifically with acrylic and I love to draw. Um, I love to make things with my hands. I love making costumes. Um, I love design. I love creating spaces. Um, during COVID, my husband and I designed and remodeled our kitchen completely ourselves, which is such a cool project. <laughs> Um, and then I would say the other piece of my art, which is not tangible, um, is, is really in the, the mental and emotional and even spiritual realm, which is comes down to coaching and supporting people who are multi-passionate like myself, who have lots of different interests, um, to really create lives that, um, will want to really own who they are as people. Um, because they're often are misunderstood in our culture and they misunderstand themselves to really own who they are and then to create lives that support who they are so that they can bring their ideas and bring their creativity and bring their art into the world. What do you mean by multi-passionate? I mean, I, I, I kind of know, cause we've talked a little bit, uh, in your mind, what did you, is this a term you coined? It's not, is... it's not actually. Um, so the first person that I believe coined it was, uh, is a woman named Marie Forleo. Um, and I actually didn't even know about it until about five, six years ago. And I was working with a coach and trying to figure out like, who is it that I really love to work with? Because um, I would do those, if anyone who's had a business and has ever done one of those client avatar where you're trying to get mm -hmm. boiled down to who you work with. They'd be like, well, what does your person love to do? I'm like everything. They like to do all the things. They're really curious and they're interested. <laughs> and I always felt like I was sort of failing at this exercise. And then I worked with the coach. She's like, oh, I think you like to work with multi-passionate people. And who a multi-passionate person is, is someone who has lots of different interests, someone who's really ever struggled to find themselves like into any neatly into any one box. Um, they've never really been able to maybe see one exact path in their life. They might have um, threads, common threads throughout the things that they're interested in, but it might look a lot of different ways. And so they've sort of struggled with that. Um, Multi-passionate people also are people who they often find interesting connections between things that are seemingly disconnected. Um, they are a very common um, thing that comes up for people is um, feeling like well, we were talking about a little bit like they're a little bit all over the place. <laughs> so that's a that's a pain point for a lot of the people that I work with. Um, and. Um, oh, just, man, I was just there's something else I just really wanted to say, and it's losing. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it'll come to me in a moment. It will come back. Um, now, the, the idea of a multi passion, it seems. Why does that seem so normal? And I, it may just be me and working, you know, and I've got two daughters who are artists. My wife is a music teacher and artist. Um, I, te you know, I come from the realm of performing arts and theater. So everybody I work with has multiple interests and they do mm -hmm. all. Um, is this not seen as normal? 
<laughs> Am I just in a little bubble all by myself over here? Well, you're definitely not by yourself. I think I think that there's a huge percentage of the population who really are truly multi-passionate, um, but maybe haven't been in environments that have supported them to express that, or they haven't been um, exposed to people who were doing so many different things. And I think that for people who really have have had the incredible you know fortune to to be in an environment where there's they're surrounded by lots of creative people doing all the different things. It is very normal because I think in creativity, creativity can't be put in a box. But Agreed. I often I think the people that I'm working with, and I think a little bit of the realm, even though I grew up in a very multi-passionate family, um, there still was very much more of these, the messages that I was receiving was kind of like, you know, you figure out the one thing that you want to do for your life, you find your, your purpose, um, and then you stick to that thing. Oh, this is what I was going to say before, which ties into this is that a lot of multi-passionate people feel like if I have to do this, they can't, they tr struggle to pick the one thing because they're like, there's nothing I can imagine myself doing forever. Like I will be so bored. And, and that's a, that boredom, once you've kind of reached a level of um, proficiency in something can, is pretty common with a lot of multi-passionate people that you want to bring in something else to sort of re, um, sort of reinvigorate your and that sounds very familiar to me as well. Yeah. You know, I've gone through three or four different careers simply because you get to a point like, okay, I'm bored. Something, you know, yeah. let's go back to school. Let's go do something else. Uh, what have you. So the, again, that's, <laughs> it's all ringing so very true. Um, you've said several things that I want to touch on and I think it's interesting. Um, number one, find your purpose. What do you think? Um, what do you think puts that notion into people's heads that there's only one purpose or you have to find a single thing? I mean, what, it, it, my guess is a societal norm. I don't know though. Yeah, it is a societal norm. Um, but it's a more recent one actually. So when, so there's a, there's a, anyone who is thinking like, am I maybe multi-passionate? Do I want to explore this a little bit further? There's an incredible book um, called Refuse to Choose. And it's something about like, you know, creating a life that includes all your interests and passions or whatever by a woman named Barbara Sher. Um, and she uses the term scanner. So versus expert. So someone's an expert who they basically go, um, they're like, their expertise is narrow and deep. Versus a scanner is someone who is like a, not necessarily super surface level, but they tend to not go maybe they don't they're not as siloed into one thing. Um, OK, but in this book, she talks about how being multi passionate, being like a renaissance person was something that was very much celebrated um, for a very long time. Those were the people that were revered culturally. But when uh, Sputnik, when the Russians <laughs> launched Sputnik into space, um, it started this science uh, and, and, and space race. And all of a sudden, all this, the resources that we put towards, you know, all the, the arts and humanities started to get narrowed into science um, and taken away from history, taken away from art, taken away from. So it was, it was like, unless you're helping us to advance and in, in these ways, all these other things are just fluff and we don't need them. So that's, well, that's really where that came from. That's fascinating that that you can pinpoint it so accurately. Yeah. First of all. <laughs> yeah, I mean that when I read that part of her book, I was like, "Whoa, this this is incredible." There was this very clear before and after. Wow. Do you think that's changing in the modern day and age? I do. I I really do because I think what is really exciting to me is to see these companies um that are really cutting edge that are really looking at different ways of, of bringing in people with very different uh, backgrounds, like into a company to see like, oh, we really feel like we could utilize your skill in this unusual way. Like you're going to bring in this perspective we don't have or changing up the way that we work instead of it being this very, you know, nine to five has to look this certain right. way or cogs in a wheel or cogs in a machine type of mentality. I think that there's a lot of, there's a shift because there's a lot of people are saying, we don't want this. We don't want that type of life. We want something where we can be humans and, and 
express more of who we are. Um, and I really think that the people that I've really been talking to about this type of subject, you know, really talk about the millennials a lot. And I think that the millennials <laughs> have gotten a bad rap for being like, they don't want to work and they don't want to do all these other things. But I think, I mean, being a millennial myself, I'm definitely biased, but I think that why wouldn't we all want to be fulfilled and, and treated well and feel good about the work that we're doing in the world? So I think that I, there's a change in consciousness that's happening with newer, the generations that are coming up. Uh, thank you for saying that. Cause I tend, uh, cause I think I wanted a little, uh, a little affirmation that I, cause I think the same way. And again, I've got two daughters. They're both in their mid twenties and that's how they act. You know, they, they don't want the big job. They don't want the, you know, they'd like a little bit of security, Sure. but it's not about the money. You know, right. they're chasing the weird things, you know, and my oldest, she's got her finger in a million different pies. I love it. And she's good at all of them, quite frankly. And depending on the day is one, you know, she chases a different, different one. Totally. So I, yeah. So. And I will say, cause I want to offer this for, for the listeners who might be seeing themselves as that because, um, you know, we're, we're made to feel like we're supposed to be these experts in something and we might really downplay our achievements, even if like, you know, like, oh, I just like, I'm all over the place or oh, I just dabble in these different things, but I'm not really, and I, and I even have these, these limiting beliefs about myself, but truly people who have broad knowledge in all these different areas are a different type of expert because your daughter having her finger in all these different pies, she's learning different perspectives and different ways of thinking and different ways of interacting mm. with the world that she's going to take those things that she's learned into other unexpected areas. And I like, I, for one would be very excited to see what, you know, what your daughters are going to create in the world because of their varied interests. So to put it another way, my kids being the weirdos that they are and the interests that they have, their education is one of a kind. Absolutely. And, and their experience is one of a kind in the grand scheme of things. And only they can supply that. Is absolutely. that a way of looking at it? Oh, absolutely. And I think that the more that people can own that their, their experiences, what they have to bring to the table, their unique talents. Um, I think that that's something that I really love to help people to see is like how this is so valuable, how to be confident in who they right. are and, and to present that into to the world. But it is challenging because people sort of misunderstand it. And so there is that they have to work past that. Right. And I, you, 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 yeah, because um, in a past life, I was a, a puppeteer, a professional puppeteer. And when people would ask me what I did for a living, I would say, I'm a puppeteer. And then there was this five seconds of instant, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Either it was great or it was, that doesn't fit into anything I understand. Right. You know, and it's this kind of, so, it, it, so it, yeah, so I get this disconnect. Can I um, ask you how you, mm -hmm. how you handled that when, when people would ask you that question and you'd have that awareness of this person might be having this judgment? I got to a point where I would look forward to people asking me that question because I would say, I'm a puppeteer just because the reaction you know, I was, I was charting reactions, you know, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And the more distant their eyes glazed over it, the funnier it was to me. Totally. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I've been in the arts so long that I know that people don't think that, you know, you know, I've got family and relatives who, you know, they're all MBAs, they're all big CEOs and they're all, you know, big wigs and something or other, but, and none of them understand what I do even after all these years. So I got to a point where it was, it was, it's fun for me to say, Oh yeah, I'm in theater. And it, you know, um, and if it gets really uncomfortable, I let him off the hook and I say, <laughs> I'm a college professor and I do this and this and this. And I go, Oh, okay. I can understand that, but it's not about whether they approve or not. It's a, it, I know now that it's because 
either they understand the art or they don't understand the art. Right. And, and there's very little in between. And it's comfortable. And so like what you're saying right. is like, where did that come from? Um, like, where did this idea of like having to find your purpose come from? It's because we like to put things in boxes. We like it to be neat and nice and tidy because that makes us feel comfortable. <laughs> and so when somebody shows up and what they have to offer and what they do in the world is not comfortable, they can't totally place it. People don't like not knowing what that means. Right. But I love right. your mischievousness in this. And I and I have placed like times where I feel like that as well. And I think more and more I feel like I like them. Like, oh, you want me to rattle off? Like, I'm also a beekeeper. And I also, you know, like I just will, you know, like let people know all these different things that I do. Um, it's kind of fun to, to sit back and be like, you don't know what to do with me. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and for a, a brief, you know, half a minute, there's this just, it's just this observation of humanness yes. <laughs> that I find, um, I'll, you know, but I'm getting old. I'm, I'm ultimately it's, I'm getting old and ornery and that kind of guy. So I think it's I great. It very, I think it's great. I, yeah. I find it very funny. <laughs> um, so I, I, I got this, the phrase that you spit up, find your purpose. Um, so in your eyes is the purpose, is there a purpose? Is there a, I know there's not a single purpose for a creative, fulfilled life, artistic life. Um, is have you redefined purpose, or is it you just trying to get away from the sour connotations? Uh, you know, I, I think that to me, what I'm, what I've been more and more over the last, you know, ten years that I've been working as a coach. Um, what I'm seeing more and more is that it's about you are the purpose. You as the individual, as the human are the purpose. And what you do is just a byproduct of your being, like who you are being in the world. And so my, what I see is that each individual purpose is being like you being the most you that you can be and to show up in your mm. expression and what your expression looks like right now might look different than it did last week, <laughs> you know, like your daughter's like, she's like, wherever, you know, the interests are kind of going. Um, but I also feel like we sometimes as humans, like, because we, because we have this analytical mind, we like to uh, ground ourselves into something. And so what I will often see for a lot of the people that I work with, just to help them kind of feel a little like sense of, instead of that feeling all over the place, feeling a sense of connection and cohesion, in their life is, mm -hmm. is looking for like maybe what some of the common threads are that they see that they really, that really lights them up that go throughout everything that they do. And that can help somebody feel like, okay, this, I, I love this, no matter the expression might look different, but this is these core things right. still continue to show up. These patterns show up. Does that resonate with you out of, just out of curiosity? Um, yes. Like I said, um, my heart belongs in the performing arts in live theater. And so everything I do can feed into that mm -hmm. somehow, some way, or, or feeds from it mm -hmm. somehow, some way. Um, my daughter got me into Dungeons and Dragons a few years ago. And it's, you know, you play it enough and you realize it's all just play acting and storytelling. Absolutely. It's all the same stuff. You know, I'm a builder. I'm a puppeteer. I build puppets. I build theater props. I love to tinker with my hands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my painting skills are all about making things look old or look like brick. You know, it all feeds in or from the theater art. So yeah, yeah, this idea that there's a common thread. Yes, I've recognized that a long time ago. So almost everything I'm interested in feeds, in, like even in the podcast world, right. it's still me. I'm not really performing. But I get to talk to people about art, right? You know, and you know the human being and the human aspect of art, and even if it's a little farther away from theater, it's still there, you know. Right. So yeah, it, it does resonate with me strongly, quite frankly. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah, you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Um, let me ask you this: uh, What are I mean, without revealing people and anything like that? What, what are some of the biggest things that prevent people from following 
you know, the multi passions, the multiple passions. Um, are there, is there just one big thing? Is it a bunch of little things or is it varied or? It's so it's varied, but there's, there's a lot of, again, common threads that I see. So one, one piece of it is definitely feeling the, is the social pressure, you know, the feeling that they, the expectations that they feel about uh, what it means to be like a successful, productive, like normal part of society. (laughs) Um, A lot of pressure from parents, a lot of pressure from, um, you know, even just those, those, those micro messages that you get when someone's like, Oh, you're going to do that. (laughs) Kind of are like, Oh my stars. Yes. You know, it's like you get those. So I think there's a lot of that that keeps, keeps people kind of like back, put, put people back in the box um, because they, because, you know, as humans, connection, sense of belonging, those things are so important. And I think that when we don't feel accepted, we don't feel understood um, and we misunderstand ourselves. I think that there's a, as multi-passionate people, there's a lot of misunderstanding um, of, you know, people feel flaky, you know, because they, they move on to a lot of different things. Well, to me, it's like, well, you just got what you needed out of that thing and you're ready to move on, or you're going to take what you need from it, or you're going to, you know, have a different relationship with that type of thing. Um, the sense of security, I think that's a big piece. People mm. are worried that, well, if I don't just pick one thing, how am I ever going to have, you know, a stable life? Um, people will, there's lots of self-doubt, imposter syndrome. Someone will want to go into something new and they're like, but who am I? Like, I don't have any real world experience in puppeteering, for example. Um, but like, you know, so who am I to like, just all of a sudden decide that I'm going to do this thing. So people might have those types of, of beliefs, not really discounting all mm-hmm. that they truly bring to the table, all their past experiences that are actually, even though they've never done that thing before, they bring so much to the table to be able to be successful and they just don't trust right. in themselves. Cause I think that's interesting. Cause um, in the, in the sense that all these things, yes, you have a unique set of experiences. You have a unique life. Your education, your personal life exp- education is so one of a kind. If it has led you to this new interest, and again, for me, this is um, <clears throat> my past experience. Why wouldn't you chase that down, that new interest? I mean, suddenly, all of a sudden, uh, you know, after this, how many years on this planet, you say, oh, look at that. Why wouldn't you chase the shiny object? Right. And I think that that's like also, I would say that that's someone who's come in more into it, just an embracing of that, where a lot of people, there's so much fear. So a lot of times by the time that I'm working with somebody, there's been a dream that they've had for years and they haven't, mm-hmm. they just, it's just been sitting there and it's been nagging at them. It's this thing that's been calling to them. And they haven't given themselves the permission because of so many limiting beliefs um, for why they shouldn't or they can't or why they don't deserve to take that risk or it's not going to be safe financially or, you know, there's there's just so many different things. Um, And also we're all motivated in different ways. We all need different levels of support to take action. And so as a coach, you know, sometimes it, sometimes what somebody needs is just to get out of their way mentally. Like that might be part of it is like, okay, here are these things that are holding you back. Let's see these unconscious programs that have been running underneath for you. What's the things that you've right. been socialized around? Let's untangle those. There's that. And then there's also people that really need accountability. They need somebody who's going to be like, okay, what's the plan? What's the action that you're going to take? How are we going to make this, you know, not have to do it all on their own. Um, have somebody who's in their corner. I mean, that's like, that's my favorite thing about being a coach is I get to be in somebody's corner. I'm a hundred percent on their team. And I'm like, you got this, you know, Um, and getting to support (laughs) them along the way. So when they freak out, I'm there to say, you know, to help them come back to like why they're wanting to do this, why it's important, why it's worth doing the scary thing. Right. Uh, So is that the biggest, the greatest joy that you get from your job that you get from, doing what you do is, or what is the greatest joy you get from your job? Let me put that. The greatest joy. Because you have not stopped smiling. This whole, <laughs> this, this, I mean, you're, you're very, again, you're, you get a real kick out of this. I do. It's so fascinating because it's never the same. 
but all like every person is like a different is a different puzzle and I'm helping them work themselves out find find where the pieces fit so I think for me like the greatest joy that I get is like somebody finally seeing themselves with clear eyes for the first time like mm. it's like gives me chills like that is so gratifying and then getting to see someone, the next part of it is then them expressing themselves in some way. So whatever that looks like. So sometimes it's just like setting boundaries with this toxic person in their life that's been tamping them down. Like that's very cool. And then other times it's them, it's them creating something, this thing that they've always wanted to put out into the world. And I get to watch them do this thing that has just been a dream come into fruition. Like it's, it's almost as gratifying as when I get to do it for myself. To watch somebody else do it. Right. Um, and again, this is all coming from me because of my performance art background. You seem to be like the ultimate audience for these people. Hmm, I love that. It's like, I mean, but, but in, in the sense that um, you as the singular audience, there's a guarantee that you're not going to boo them off the stage. Right. It, and it seems like as the client or the performer, you know, if I know that I'm not going to screw this up, it's going to be a little easier. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally. even... Yeah, it does. I love that, um, that metaphor <laughs> because yeah, for me, it's like that person, like they, you, they get to show up however they are, you know, like I, mm -hmm. like, yeah, they're not going to do it wrong. I'm going to be, I'm going to support them no matter what, you know, even the things that they might see as, as a failure, I'm going to help them flip the script on that <laughs> and see how right. actually like what is to be gained of so when something doesn't go the way that they want it to and, and things like that. Right. But, it, it, and again, this is just my observation. It feels like having that kind of backup, whether, you know, whether you're backstage or in the audience, you've got the support. Yeah. And that's why, that's how it aligns with me anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Interesting. Yep. And exactly. I totally agree. Um, and again, it reminds me of these moments. Okay, in other podcasts, we've talked about performances and audiences. And when it's good, there's this moment. There's this shiny little moment in time and space where everybody's in that same tiny moment of time and space where everybody's in sync, everybody gets it, everybody's right there. And it sounds like the same kind of moments for you, even on this uh, tiny scale. Yeah. I love that you're making these connections. Like this is, this is like candy for my brain because <laughs> it's like Yay. so cool to see these connections. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, like when we're really getting into something and there's this like synergy of, and like, you know, and, and I get to watch people have breakthroughs, you know, I'm sure it's like performing mm -hmm. arts. Like you get to see the people that you're acting with, um, or just like seeing a performance, like someone's had a breakthrough and they're like stepping into their power and they're stepping into their expression. And it's like, you're just like, yeah, you Whoa. see that moment of discovery and it's, oh. yes. yes, it's magic. And it's something that it's like you, like, I don't know that there's anything quite like it. So it's like, you want to keep going back and to be in that space and to watch people do that. Yeah. It makes you want to work harder to do it again because mm -hmm. it's so amazing. <laughs> and to feel it yourself. You know, I think again, like relating it, it's like you get to, as, as actors, you're supporting one another to do that. Right. Um, Absolutely. So you're, so you're getting to play those supporting roles and, and, and when there's that synergy, that also feels very cool. You yeah. Know? there's a, I, yeah. I see myself as like on a level playing field with my clients, you know, it's like, like I'm there just to guide them and to be in there with them. And we're like doing this thing together, like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, so it's very cool when there's that, that connection to make magic happen. Yeah. Cause on stage you're working with a, an acting partner or a group of people. Um, and when it clicks between the group of people on stage, that's really, you feel it and you're done and you're elated and the adrenaline's flowing and it's just one of those magic little things. Um, but if you can repeat it in front of an audience and the audience joins that little moment, you know, it's just a thousand fold bigger. So say amplification. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you get to enjoy both of those <laughs> moments, both with the creativity and then, then watching and then being an audience in 
a much bigger creation somehow. Yeah. I, I, I might be reaching a little bit, but no, absolutely. I mean, I getting, getting to watch what people create, um, is very cool. You know, like I've got a, a client that started a, a web serial, um, of like fantasy web serial. And so getting to like follow along when he publishes, like I get to like, yes, <laughs> it's like put another <laughs> thing out into the world. I get to watch that or a, another client who started a, a store in town. I get to like walk by and be like, Oh, there's people in there, people buying things. There's people and, in there. That's, yay. Yeah. It's just like, it's so, it's so cool um, to just have been able to be part of that becoming for them. Right. And, and suddenly that's a proud parent moment. <laughs> it is. It is. You know, it's like, oh, I'm so proud of you. So, yeah, yeah it's and, just amazing. And I, and I just, and I like to be that mirror because sometimes I think we can do something really great and then we downplay it or we, we, once it becomes normal, we forget how great it is. And I like to be the ones to like continue to remind them like, no, this is cool. Oh. This is, you did something really awesome. And I want you to continue to be in that energy. Because the more that you're in that right. energy, the more you're going to want to continue <laughs> to do these great things. How did you find yourself in this line of work? I mean, <sighs> first of all, I'm inspired by your your attitude and your your thought process behind what it means to be successful and an artist and productive, for lack of a better <laughs> word. How did you How did you fall into this? this again, that. To me, this is a very new uh, realm. Yeah. Uh, well, it kind of found me, I would say. So, you know, growing up, I when I was in high school, I started to see that there was this pattern that had really been throughout my entire life where I was the person that people would come to, to ask, you know, just to be an ear or to ask advice. Um, even, you know, as adults, or adults would come to me as a child and ask for my advice, which I was like, this is, you know, even as like a kid, I'm like, this is weird, but I'll have a conversation with you about these things. Okay. Um, I have to ask, why yeah. do you think that is? <laughs> well, so depending on, and I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Just, I love it. Fascinating. Um, so my whole life I've, I've heard over and over from people, um, that they just see me as an old soul. Like, I think that's just like, that's the only, I mean, I don't exactly know why, but I think I've always had um, maybe a maturity to me and an ability to sit and be with people and listen and and people just felt like they could talk to me. Like sometimes people I would just have met, they would start telling me something and like, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I've never told this <laughs> anybody this before. And every, you know, like as it happens like a few times, you're like, okay, maybe there's something here for me to pay attention to. Um, but then on the other side of it, I'm very like, I hadn't learned proper emotional boundaries, um, which we aren't taught really, I, at least not my generation. I don't feel like was taught this, that I really took on a lot of people's motions. And I, so there was this awareness of, I love talking and supporting and being with people, um, mm -hmm. through their challenges. And also I realized it was making me sick. So I was, I was feeling like in order to really care about somebody, I had to feel their emotions. I had to basically be going through it with them to the point that I had horrible stomach ulcers and, um, it was just, was very sick. And what, wow. what I realized was I finally had this, um, amazing doctor who, instead of prescribing me another pill <laughs> was like, um, what's going on in your life? And she started talking to me about my, my stress and my anxiety and how I was taking things on. And she really helped me to see that in order to, I can care about people. This is long roundabout. I wasn't mean to tell this part, but you know, it's for here we're going, um, <laughs> you know, that you don't have to take on other people's problems or these things that you're stressed about. She helped, like she flipped the, the, the mental script on some of these things that I had been thinking and I watched my body start to heal as I started to change my, the way that I was thinking. So that was this like interesting, amazing experience for me as a, as a kid, um, like a teenager into, into college. And, but when I was 18, I had a, a substitute teacher for one of my English classes who was also a life coach. And she was talking to me about coaching and, and the philosophy of it being not so much about, you know, like psychology of like digging into your past and being so much in the trauma, 
because I was very concerned about, could I survive <laughs> being a psychologist yeah. or a psychiatrist? Like, is that something I could really do? But I love this philosophy of like, where do you want to go and how do we get you there? Who do you want to be? How do you want to show up in the world? What's your like most authentic expression and how do we get you there? And I just, there was something about that, like lightning bolt, like for me, when something an inspiration strikes, I get like a little zing up my spine. I don't know if you have something like that, where you just like have this mm -hmm. body tell. And I was like, whoa. And I couldn't <laughs> stop thinking about it. And, and then that just became, I was like at 18, I was like, I want to be a life coach, but didn't do that right away. Cause I had all these mental stories like, oh, I can't be a life coach, even though I'd kind of been one <laughs> in ways <laughs> unofficially, um, for a long time. So went to college, um, double majored in art, actually never finished the art degree that which I have some, some mild regret around. Um, and then it wasn't until after I worked at a domestic violence shelter for four and a half years, again, seeing how being in the trauma, um, not the healthiest work environment either, that I was again, becoming sick. And I was like, this mm. just isn't right for me. Um, but then found this amazing life coaching program. And, and then here we are. <laughs> basically skip wow. forward <laughs> wow so it sounds like you were struggling with some of the things that you now try to help other people with absolutely I just never felt you know I another little side tangent um my one of my high school teachers had this really cool assignment to we could get extra credit if we wrote our future selves a letter and he kept it and sent it to us five years later. Oh, and what a yeah, great idea. It was amazing. Ooh. And I remember reading it and actually recently pulled it out again because I was like wanting to remind myself. And as this 18 year old, I was like, you know, maybe you'll do something like life coaching so you can incorporate your love of, of art and design and fashion and you know, like all these different, I had all these different things in psychology. Like I wanted, I, even at 18, I was like, there's gotta be this way that I can incorporate all these different interests into this unique job that lets me just be who I want to be. Cause I never had a job that I really, I didn't really, even just, just life coaching on its own. Isn't even like varied enough for me. Like I want to be able to <laughs> have the, ex, you know, all the other things. So. But it's yours. It's mine. And it's your job. It's you, it, it's something uniquely you. Yep. That I think is, I think is the vital part to remember. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's amazing. That is simply amazing. Well, thank you. Um, you quickly blurted out that you regretted not doing your art or your art degree. What did you just say? Yeah. So, in and I don't want to dwell on negative things, but no, you have no. A, uh, I think it's part of it, though. I think we have these journeys where there's things that we don't maybe, you know, follow through with something that we really wanted to. Um, but when I was in college, you couldn't, you couldn't take an art class even unless you were majored in art and they didn't have an art minor either, which I need to look back. Cause I think my college does offer in a minor now. So I might actually have earned it, <laughs> but not <laughs> received the, the certificate. Um, but so I decided to double major in art and, and I loved it. It was something where, like, I love being in classes because it, your the teachers just challenge you to to create mm -hmm. art that you wouldn't normally create, you know. And I love yeah. taking fiber art and then and three D art and figure um, figure drawing and so I basically took all the foundational classes, um, but never had a concentration and didn't didn't end up finishing the degree. I was mm -hmm. I was um, was going to be spending a few, probably another year and a half or something in college if I finished it. And I just was ready to, I was ready to move on. So mm -hmm. there was also, I think that was genuine in that point in time. Um, but the reframe, I guess, really for myself is I've just, I've continued to create art even without having a degree. <laughs> yeah. So. And, I, and, uh, and like I said, I'm a college professor in the theater arts. And that's always what I'm telling people. You don't just do it. If you want to go act, go act. Mm -hmm. If you want to draw, go draw. Yep. If you want to be on the radio, go be on the radio. You know, do whatever. To, um, and especially for artists. And I don't know if you find this to be true. That, you know, 
the idea of going through formal training to be an artist isn't always the truest art or the truest method. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, you know, I've got a PhD and to do what I do, I don't need it. <laughs> I've got enough life experience to have figured it out by now. Absolutely. But, um, you know, and I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful message for, for other people who might, um, resonate with being multi-passionate, multi-creative is how much life experience you truly do have. And that instead of handing over our power to someone else to say, you know, I deem you worthy of making art, <laughs> claiming yeah. it for ourselves. But I think art and creativity, and, and again, this might be something that is a little outside of, um, of your realm because you're so you're, you're around so many people who are really embrace creativity and, and embrace art that a lot of people feel like they, they don't deserve, like they haven't earned the title artist or creator in oh. some way, you know, they don't have the accolades or they don't, they don't see themselves as doing it well enough or with enough depth to get to claim that title. Yeah. Yeah. I fight against that. I fight against that idea of I deem you worthy attitude. Um, Cause I try not to <laughs> being a teacher. I try not to say that, you know, and I try to, you know, one of my missions in life is to just, um, you're here, you're doing it. You're an actor. Yeah. You're here, you're doing it. You're a playwright, a designer, an, an artist, you know, and I tell that to my kids all the, and I tell it to my wife, you know, she's a musician and she started painting over the last couple of years. I'm like, yeah, you've done it. You're an artist. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. You don't need any of this. You just so. And the, um, and the role, and I want to just acknowledge the role that you're playing is so, um, has been so vital for me to be able to have teachers that have guided me throughout my journey. I don't know that I would have, I don't know that I would have um, stretched myself as, as an artist, there's that, I mean, like, again, there's things I never would have even attempted creating had I not had a teacher that was assigning me, like say, okay, here's your challenge. Here's your prompt, create this. Yeah. It's very cool. Or pushing me, like push your values, go further. Don't hold back. Like just be okay to mess up. You know? Yeah. I needed that. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I wish a lot of teachers in other subjects in all areas we, we kind of consider the same thing, you know? I do too. It's just, it's the idea of, it's the challenge, you know, set up the challenge. If you fall, I'm there to help you up and we'll figure it out again. That's the attitude. And I, it sounds like what, that's what you do yeah. in, in, as a life coach and guiding multi-passionates. I think it's getting away from like a singular right answer. You know, I think our, uh, our, a lot of times like school, Cool has kind of set us up to be like, there's one right answer for things. And we mm-hmm. internalize that message and it couldn't really be further from the truth for most oh, yeah. of life. Yeah. That's my house. We have this phrase, there's no such thing as normal. There's no such thing as perfect. There's no such thing as forever. I and, love that. you know, whenever we get into those ruts, one of us will spit it back out. Like there's no such thing as normal. Like, okay, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I can go do this. And, and embracing but we repeat it enough that. that yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we repeat it enough that we're, we're starting to believe it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. And that's a lot of it. We have to start changing our, our brain, like yeah. literally rewiring our brains around these yeah. more empowering thoughts. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Agreed. Um, a couple more questions kind of out of the blue. Um, is there, a, a, an artwork or an art form or something that you haven't done that you think you would like to do someday? Oh, that's a good, this question. is kind of my end of the interview, James Lipton kind of stuff. Yeah. That I haven't done that I would like to do. I think, um, so maybe I've done it in small ways. My brain is always like, always like challenging any absolutes, but I've done, um, I would love to do like a huge installation, like immersive art. Like I, I'm always, I love when, when there's an artist who like gets a whole room and they just fill it with whatever, whatever the thing is that they have and you walk through it and you, you get to just be fully immersed. I would love the experience of having Ooh. a huge space and just doing something like that. 
That sounds exciting. I think it'd be really awesome. That would be awesome. That'd be, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to do that. <laughs> Makes me think of, I like, um, if, are you familiar with Meow Wolf? I'm not. Do you know what that is? Okay. Look it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is this, it's basically this art collective that has come together to create these massive immersive art installations. Uh, the first one is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I really love it. I mean, you, you feel like you're walking through other worlds. Like it's very strange on the senses and it's just so cool. And they just put one in Denver um, about an hour and a half from where I live. So it, they're starting to pop up in different places. So Meow Wolf, if you want to. So that's that's Meow Wolf. And it's weird. Like I love I think sometimes like I um, I think like a little side note to to your response is that. I sometimes can still be a little bit logical in terms of what I'm creating and sometimes like creating just to create or creating something that's just kind of like not even necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but just like weird. <laughs> I, I would like to challenge myself to do more of that. And that would be cool to combine that with the immersive art experience. Oh, let me know when it happens. Cause that sounds amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anything out there that you know, you would never want to try. <laughs> what um this is funny that this is what popped into my mind i've seen some <clears throat> art installations where it's like people have have or not or art pieces where somebody's done it with like um like human feces and blood and then like rolled on a canvas you ever seen? No. <laughs> <laughs> um that i like bodily fluids and like art i personally don't ever want to try that <laughs> to go out to like another okay. really weird place. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's the, <laughs> we don't need to chase that one. No, no, not at all. <laughs> um, okay. Um, last question. Where can we see and or experience some of your art and what you do? So the place, although I've been taking a little bit of a social media break, but the place you can kind of get to know me probably the most in terms of my ever evolving expression right now um, would be on Instagram. So I'm at Caitlin underscore boss heart. And there's a million ways to spell Caitlin and boss heart. <laughs> so I'm sure you'll have all the links. Um, I will put the links, correct yep. links down there. Yep. Website is also Caitlin boss um, And I also have a podcast, which um, we has ended at this point in time, but I've got a couple of seasons and it's called Full Heart Free Voice. Um, so if that's something that people are interested in hearing, um, it's a book club style podcast. And the first season we did Women Who Runs With The Wolves, uh, a feminist classic all about uh, archetypes um, and oh, embracing your inner wild woman, which is really just your truest self. And then um, the second season, which we didn't, my my co-host, we needed to to end for some personal reasons. Um, we the first half of it, or it's a half of the book of Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, so about creativity and things like that. So if people are interested in in looking into that, they can. Thank you, uh, Caitlin. Thank you so much for spending the morning with me. This, uh, like I said, I I love talking about process. And I love talking about, uh, you know, philosophy of the artist. And I think you have a wonderfully unique insight to a lot of us. <laughs> well, thank you. Based on what you do. So uh, thanks a ton for uh, sharing with us today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. And these conversations light me up. So I really appreciate Oh, yeah, you. me too. Absolutely. So yeah, I appreciate you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for hanging around and geeking out with us. If you enjoyed the show, hit the like and subscribe buttons. And more importantly, join the conversation and leave us a message or comment. We'd love to hear about your nerdy art. Thanks again, and join us next week for more Art Nerds.